And that draws us to the end of our meditation. That was 45 minutes. It's good to dedicate merit now while your minds are bright and relaxed. And uh, whatever increase in well-being you might be feeling, whatever increase in brightness, radiance, bring to mind someone who might need some help. You might want to bring to mind deceased relatives or friends who have some challenges and dedicate the merit of that meditation session with that person or those people. Or if you like, dedicate it to all beings. We just make that wish. I share the merit. I dedicate this merit with uh, such and such. Very good. And I just ask, um, who feels a bit better than they did 45 minutes ago? Very good. Meditation is a wonderful thing. So we do have a really extraordinary potential actually. We have a great resource right there. And we just have to uh, practice and maintain the causes for allowing that potential to get revealed, the delusions which obscure it to drop away. But it's there all the time. So whatever peace you're feeling, that's coming from in your mind, that's not coming from me, that's uh, occurring within your mental continuum. Sometimes teachers can help us focus, but it's when we maintain our focus, we're the ones that experience the peace. All of us, that's our potential. Meditation also produces a lot of good karma. Lord Buddha explained, the Arahants explained, the Bodhisattvas explained. Meditation creates a great deal of good karma. Good karma ripens as pleasant mental and physical experiences in the future. So it's very helpful. I thought I might tell just a interesting little story, I think somewhat relating to merit and devas. Probably don't get many stories about devas on the street in Melbourne most days, so I, I figure if I come back from Asia I should talk about some of these fun things. I was going to Bodh Gaya, I had the good fortune to go to Bodh Gaya in February, India, and I was going for six weeks. So for the Buddhist pilgrim, the opportunity to go to Bodh Gaya is exciting and it's wonderful. There are also some dangers. There's a lot of disease, a lot of illness, a bit of violence, a lot of dirt. Um, so before I go to India, I often go to pay respects to my teachers and also go to some of the famous old temples. And uh, so I went to the Emerald Buddha, Temple of the Emerald Buddha in Bangkok. And I went with the bhikkhu, my monk friend who was going with me, and we got these beautiful wreaths of jasmine blossoms, and we were going to offer that to the Emerald Buddha to ask for protection and blessings. So we're not asking for that from the statue. We believe, I believe, traditional Buddhists believe that although the Buddha went to Parinibbana, the merit that he generated over hundreds of thousands of lifetimes that he determined that merit in a particular way, that he's very interested in taking care of his disciples. So he made many dedications, many aspirations, many prayers that while he was developing all of that virtue, that he might be able to help as many beings as possible. The Buddha was boundlessly compassionate and kind, and he had a very powerful mind, so he dedicated the merit from his mind to help take care of us, his children to the extent that we have the merit to receive that. So there is a protective influence there. And we go for refuge to the Buddha. It's not just an intellectual exercise, it's, uh, it's very real. There is something there which is protective in going for refuge. So we use statues, especially at places where thousands of other people are doing this. You can make requests. And it's not to a self, and it's not to someone in heaven, but it's just to the, the merit of the Buddha that he generated. 
and you can feel it. You go to holy places and you meditate, you can feel there's something there, very uplifting, very powerful. So I was hoping to meditate, but the problem was I didn't realize the Temple of the Emerald Buddha closed at 3.30 in the afternoon, and we arrived at 3.15. So they just let us in to offer our flowers, but they didn't allow us to meditate. But we made our little prayer. May we be safe, may we be protected in India, may we travel safely, and may we return and continue to live our monks' lives in Thailand. <laughs> because India is a great place to visit. Uh, Bihar is a great place to visit. Go on pilgrimage, but I wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> so we asked, uh, please help us return safely as well. But the problem was, I had a friend who was outside, who also, he was coming with us, and he wasn't allowed in because it was too close to closing time, but they let the monks in. So I came out and I thought, well, there's another temple over the river, 15 minutes walk away in a little ferry ride. It's called Wat Rakang, the Temple of the Bell. A very famous monk, Somdet Do, very famous monk in Thailand about 200 years ago, lived there. And it's a pilgrimage site for that monk, too many Thais. And so I thought I should take my friend there because I have some very beautiful evening chanting at uh, five. And I take my friend there so that he can make his prayers to go to India safely and return safely. So we went there. We had a meditation and I meditated through the chanting, which is very nice. And that man also had a very nice meditation and he made his prayers. Now, as I was leaving, we were going to India the very next day. As I was leaving that temple, Wat Rakang, the temple of the bell, a lady asked me, where are you from? I said, I'm, uh, I'm from Pechabun. What monastery did you ordain at? She asked. I ordained at Ajahn Chah's monastery. She said, what are you doing? I said, uh, <laughs> I'm going to India tomorrow. And I came to uh, make some prayers for my own safety and success of that venture. And she said, where are you going to India? I said, I'm going to Bogaya. And she said, well, I'm going to India tomorrow too, but I'm going to Delhi. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm an airline stewardess. So anyway, that's all, I, that's all I heard. But a very nice thing occurred at the airport the next day, which I, I had no idea was going to occur. But I'll tell you, but before this, I decided that I wanted to offer a lot of flowers because uh, going to Bodh Gaya is a special opportunity. And Lord Buddha said in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, his last teaching, that anyone that offers fragrances and bright colors in these places as an act of puja, reverence, that that will create merit, which will be a benefit for a long time. He also said that the best way to make offerings to the Buddha is by practicing. But uh, my sense is it's good to do all of it. Offer, <laughs> do whatever you can to make as much merit as you can in whatever way that you can. Cover all the bases. So, <laughs> It's a bit of an Asian, Asian approach. And so, so I went to the flower market with another friend at midnight because the flowers in India are very colorful but they don't smell very nice. But the flowers in Thailand are incredibly fragrant. So you can get these wreaths of jasmine that have been strung together that aren't yet blossomed, which is what we did do. And by the time you get to Bodhgaya, 12 hours later, the flowers are just opening and this incredible smell of jasmine blossoms. So anyway, so we got lots of those. A lot of people who couldn't go asked us to make offerings of flowers on their behalf. So there was a big budget for flowers. And uh, so anyway, I got a little bit carried away and there was a few bags. And I didn't realize that flowers actually weigh quite a bit, actually, when <laughs> you have lots of them. Marigolds and as well, nice big yellow marigolds in uh, wreaths. So anyway. So I got to the airport and I had my check-in luggage and I had my carry-on bag, but I also had four bags of flowers and I was a bit worried about the weight. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, a very nice thing happened. As we, nobody stopped us in security, everybody let us through with our flowers. And uh, we walked over the tarmac and I was getting on the plane and we were coming in through the front door. And the bursar came to me and he said, let me help you with those. And he took the flowers and he put them at the front of the plane and then he motioned for myself and my bhikkhu companion to sit in the front row in business class. <laughs> Although we had economy tickets. So that's very interesting, isn't it? And so I thought in that moment, the devas of the Emerald Buddha Temple are very nice. <laughs>
Well, I don't know exactly what was happening, but it's an interesting synchronicity, isn't it, that we ended up going to the other temple where the lady worked for Thai Airlines and found out exactly what flight we were on and what we were doing. And the next day that uh, we were given those seats, so it was really wonderful when we landed in Gaia Airport, my foot was the first foot to touch that holy ground. That was really nice. So I felt very grateful. And we dedicated merit to the Devas of the Emerald Buddha from India. And we offered our flowers. But the point of that story is, I believe that there are Buddhist Devas that support Buddhist practitioners and that they want to help us all, but they need to know what we're doing and what help we need. So when we went to the Emerald Buddha and we said, this is what we want to do, I want to go and meditate 300 hours under the Bodhi tree in the next six weeks, that probably got some attention because it's a very wholesome thing to want to do, isn't it? So if you were a Buddhist Devi, you'd probably think, well, that seems worth supporting. And then, uh, then you're clear. So what you're asking for is protection, that you can do this and return safely. So it's kind of nice to talk about flowers and devas and business class tickets. Coming back, we are in economy. <laughs> it's, good, it's good to keep things balanced. And <laughs> it's fine. I'm quite happy in economy anyway, but... My poor old friend, of course, who uh, who wasn't a monk, he was he wasn't in business class. He was <laughs> okay, actually, that flight for those of you, if if you have a chance to fly it, it's really wonderful because one of the only flights in the world where I think everyone is going with the intention of making good karma, and nobody's drinking any alcohol, so it's a really beautiful atmosphere. There's a sense of, and people come from many different countries. So people come from Taiwan, Singapore, Burma, Malaysia, because uh, Bangkok is the flight to Gaia is leaving from Bangkok. So all these Buddhist pilgrims, nobody's drinking, everybody's talking quietly, everyone wants to go and make good karma. So it's really beautiful. It's like being in a little deva realm. <laughs> they have a lot of mudita beings who have good karma, who are consciously making more good karma training their minds. Very beautiful. Now with regards to meditation, and our meditation, I do want to give people opportunity to ask any questions, if anyone has any questions or experiences or doubts, confusion, anything they want to ask about the meditation methods, yeah? Any questions? It's a good sign actually, it means you all know how to meditate. All we need to do now is do it every day, isn't it? And I often say to people that you, it'd be good to have a long-term plan. Once a day is a minimum. You have to do it at the beginning of the day, before you feel tired, before you turn on your stupid phone and uh, look, at your, <laughs> look at your email, all that stuff, before it starts beeping and humming and singing songs. Do your meditation in the morning before your mind gets cramped. You, you might have to practice with a bit of grumpiness, but that's okay. Remember what I was saying at the very beginning of the talk was that after the meditation, you'll feel the benefits of the meditation. You don't necessarily feel the benefits in the first five minutes, ten minutes. Some grumpiness, some sleepiness, that I want to be sleep, I want to sleep more, okay? But you understand that if we don't establish the habit, as we get older, our habits get deeper and time goes faster and you find that you're 30 and you still don't meditate every day and you're 40 and you still don't meditate every day and you're 50 and you're 60 and you're 70 and you still don't meditate every day. And there goes another human birth where you didn't utilize your opportunity. So I really think once a day as the standard and that's as a gift to yourself. If you really care for yourself, I was trying to get you in touch a little while ago with caring for yourself acknowledging the challenges and difficulties and then responding with care. So if you care for yourself, this is something you give yourself. And the merit that it produces is something that you give your next life as well. If you can establish it once a day, if you really do stick to it, if you really are really struggling with that and it's the beginning, then make some kind of vow if you can, four times a week maybe as a minimum. And I really do think the morning is better because lives just get busier and busier and people are exhausted by the end of the day. So morning is better, but suppose you've made some vow, I'm going to do it four times a week and at the end of the day, you, end of the night you haven't done it, then do it before sleeping. Some days, if you didn't do it in the morning. 
But if you can establish it as a daily practice, you will see the benefits and you will find on those days that you don't meditate, if you were busy, there'll be a feeling of missing something and there'll be a feeling of wanting to meditate. So it's not this external force saying you should meditate, if you meditate you're good, if you don't meditate you're bad. It's nothing to do with that. It has to do with the well-being that you will feel if you do it and the clarity that you'll come to cherish. And if you don't do it, you'll notice that a lack of clarity or darkness is like taking over and is scary. And you'll feel like you want to go and meditate, you want to clean your mind. And then once you've established it once a day, what I would hope is that as you get older, you start to do it twice a day. And then before you die, I would really like it if you're doing it three times a day. So if you could have it as a standard, every morning, every afternoon, every evening, every day you meditate. Because then you really are a practicing Buddhist if you can accomplish that. By the time you died you became a practicing Buddhist, you became a sincere follower of Lord Buddha by following his instructions to practice, to begin to be an island unto yourself, to find a refuge in your own heart, to realize your own potential. The Buddha points the way, he reveals the path, whether we realize it is dependent on our walking it ourselves. So uh, I offer that for your contemplation. And I rouse you, please meditate. At His Holiness teachings in Sydney the other day, we are talking about the potential of minds. So there's 10,000 people came to the public talk, there wasn't a seat left in the Sydney Entertainment Centre. And as His Holiness was leaving the stage, and saying goodbye, you could just feel this incredible love feeling the entertainment center. It's really interesting because I, I had a stall there, we were giving away some teachings for free, which is a really great thing to do. Again, taking the opportunity to make good karma. When we have opportunities to make good karma, we, we should. We have opportunities to help people, we, we should. So I was there, so I felt the entertainment center as we came in before the Dalai Lama arrived. And everything's black, the walls are black, and the curtains are black, and the roof, the ceiling's black, and kind of a rock and roll venue. And uh, it feels a bit creepy actually, because probably a lot of alcohol being consumed there, usually, and a lot of head banging and whatnot. But it was a really interesting contrast, so once they put the nice carpet up, and the pictures, and the brocades, and set up the shrines, and two or three hundred monks and nuns turn up, and then the Dalai Lama comes in, a very different feeling. Now as His Holiness was leaving, you could just feel this love, like 10,000 people just love this man and have goodwill for him and want him to live a long life and the compere was saying, we really hope you live a long life and we really hope you come back. And, and His Holiness said himself, he said, I very much appreciate this atmosphere because I can feel so much love. Why do these people love the Dalai Lama? What I would suggest is they can feel his love for them. And then of course he affirms their potential. People leave feeling the way you create outer peace is by developing inner peace, the way you make big changes by making little changes. And when someone like the Dalai Lama says it with that kind of authority, people believe it and they feel heartened. I don't need to resolve the wars, the famines, all I need to do is do a bit better in my life today. And every day do the little bit that I can do. And it has a, a big implication for the world. And so people are optimistic, people have hope and people feel blessed. The other thing of course is his loving kindness. So I think 10,000 people in that venue and I think that most people feel that the Dalai Lama saw them, is aware of them, cares for them, wishes them well. So when they feel that, so this is the result of his loving kindness meditation and I was talking a little before about the potential of a human mind. So you all have the potential to fill the Sydney Entertainment Centre with a mind of loving kindness. It might take a few hundred lifetimes. But it's wonderful to know that that's the potential. And it's wonderful to see the way that affects people. And it's really nice when you think about the Buddha, the historical Buddha. It's also good to remember that the Buddha had just as much compassion as the Dalai Lama. He was also incredibly kind and most people who met him felt very touched by him. So when we 
when we recollect the Buddha in our Buddha Nusati, the qualities of the Buddha, you can just really feel confident that he had incredible kindness and that he cared for us. And that the reason he spent all those eons cultivating the qualities that would lead to his Buddhahood was because he cared for you. And uh, just like the Dalai Lama cares for you. And so uh, what remains is for us to really take care of ourselves. You begin to be able to take care of other people a little bit better as well. And uh, Anyway, I'm talking too much. <laughs> nice to see you all. Have a good night. Hope to see you again on Thursday.